I know we've got a smaller crowd today, but I did have a, a thought in my heart that it won't be long, but it won't be 10 minutes either. So, so I hope you didn't expect too quick of one. If you open your Bibles, book of 2 Samuel, or come with me here, chapter 23, I'm going to start at verse 12, and I'm going to read you one of the stories of David, just one, there's so much we can preach about, about David, 2 Samuel 23 and 12, you stood so much and before, I'm not going to ask you to stand again unless if, if you feel that it's your conviction, then I'm not going to stop you. But you're welcome to stay seated at this time. Second Samuel, chapter 23, verse 12. If you're, if you're there, say amen. Thank you so much. Amen. I didn't hear you. James over there, like I'm purposely ignoring him. I didn't hear him. All right. But he, talking about David, stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephim. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men brake through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. <coughs> Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Verse 17, And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. I want to try to preach to you this morning life after the victory. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the needs that you've met, Lord, the needs you're going to meet. I thank you for the opportunity to worship in this house. I pray now for your blessing and your anointing on this message, Lord. I pray that it's your word. Fill our hearts, Lord. Be in our minds, God. Be in our, our thoughts and our, our words, Lord, and our actions. Be in control, Lord. Be the authority. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You need another bottle of water out. Life after the victory. Because they had just had a major victory. We started with that. They just defeated the Philistines in a battle. And the Bible says the Lord wrought a great victory. Does anybody by chance, and I should never ask this, I always tell myself I'm going to quit asking it. But for some reason, I'm a glutton for punishment. Does anybody by chance remember what I preached the last time I was here two Sundays ago? That's all right. I preached it. <laughs> I get it. I'm not mad at you. I'm, I'm not. Uh, although I could have told you what my pastor preached two weeks ago. Yeah, I've got a different memory for that kind of thing. You told me. I preached about when you don't handle business. And I talked about how Jonathan was killed by an enemy that Saul did not take care of when he had the chance. Right? But we're talking about breaking through and just conquering that. And the church has a lot of battles. And, and we get excited and all of our attention is on those battles. But when that battle is over, when you get that job or when that oppressive supervisor is moved somewhere else or when that cancer is healed or whatever, whenever after that battle, we actually lose more people after the victory than we do throughout the battle. And it's just something about we don't know how to live in a peacetime environment. We like the mountaintop experiences, but we actually live in the valleys. 
Some people just don't know how to live if they're not in war. That's a major problem with the military folks today, your lifers. They get so used to a combat situation that when they come home, they don't know how to adjust to not being at war. Sometimes that fight takes a lot out of us physically or emotionally. I guarantee you, it doesn't matter if I get up here and just read or if I get up here and preach my heart out after the service, I am drained. My kids will tell you that I'm dead. I'm just exhausted. All I do is whine about it all the way home. Oh, I'm tired. Because it takes a lot out of us. And that's the case here. David is older. Okay, This is not David the young boy that killed Goliath. This is at the end of his days, his last, his last battles. He's an older guy now, and he is tired of fighting. He just won, and he's sitting down, and he's remembering how good and how sweet that water tasted. Not just normal water, but that certain water from the well of Bethlehem. Mm, that'll preach if you think about it. Some of us get tired, and we remember how the presence of God felt at that altar, at that moment. It's different. Then when you're driving through your car and you're feeling, and you got your gospel radio on and you're feeling the song, that's nice. But it's not the same as the well that is at the gate of Bethlehem. It's just something about that special moment. You're like, boy, I remember how it felt when nothing else mattered but what I was saying to God. And we, and we can, we, we can relate to that. We've been, we've been exhausted. We're tired. And all we can think about is that altar call moment that we used to have and we're not having it right now. That makes sense to somebody today? Does that relate to somebody? We've been there. And so this is David. He has been fighting ever since the life. And that'll preach too. But you need to understand that your giant may only be the beginning of the war. You would think that the, the giant would be the climax of his story. But it was just chapter 1. You get excited about the one victory in your life and you think God's done with you. It just got started. And now you have to learn how to live after the victory because you're tired and you're wore out. And Eleazar said in verses before this, has fought for so long that his hand played to the sword. The fight changes you and it deforms you, but you still have to live after the battle, after the victory. When you're after the, after the victory, that's when you have to battle fatigue the most. That's when you have to battle your injuries the most. Your adrenaline can take care of you while you're in the battle, and you may not realize the cut that you have. But now as you're sitting down, you can assess the damage and the wounds, and you've got to take care of it. And here is David with that same exhaustion, and he's thirsty. He longed for a refreshing how many of our souls are longing for a refreshing today? Brother Mike, we, we had a good service two weeks ago. That was 14 days ago. I wasn't here last Sunday. I don't know how you felt then. I, I watched it online, and it's not the same thing. But even if we did, that was seven days ago. And I long for a refreshing again. I wonder if anyone came to church this morning longing for a refreshing. The Bible says that he had 30 people around him. And he had an army of up to 600. At least at this point. But only 30 were around him. Of the 30 that was around him, only 3 were close enough to hear the king's desire. When everybody is here, we average about 30 in attendance at this church when everybody comes to church. Okay? And I'm not talking about everybody that hasn't been here forever. All of our regulars, when we all when all the regulars quit letting work or whatever, if we just not interfere, and I'm not blaming you saying, if we were all here, we'd average about 30. And I wonder of the 30 that are here normally, how many are actually close enough to hear the desires of the king? Because just being in the house is not enough. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. I love that expression. We need...
to get close enough to hear the king. Of the 30 people that were there, only three did something about the need for the king. How many people come to church and they're just glad to be among the number of 30? And they have no desire to actually do anything on their own. They may mimic your hand clap. If you raise your hand, they may raise their hands. But they're just there to copy you. How many of them actually have the burden to be the one that starts the move of God? How many of you will say, excuse me, I don't know how high you are, but I've got to worship anyway. I don't know what kind of week you've had, but I need to praise him anyway. The king needs to be praised, the king needs to be worshipped, and if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be me. How many are of that excuse of kids this morning? I'm going to be the one that makes a difference. I'm not waiting on Sister Yates to sing the song. I know this is time for church to start. I'm going to start praising my God. And so we got to have that mentality. Brother Yates is really sticking it up today, boy. He's done, he's done much better. He, 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 he's got to be dehydrated. Maybe he's having a headache. But you know what? Amen anyway, Pastor. It may not be your best delivery, but I understand what you're saying and it's right. Hallelujah. Praise God. Preach. Amen. Amen. we got to be the ones that makes a difference. And that's part of life after the victory. You still have to be one of the ones close enough to do something about the needs. There's a difference in being in the church and being a committed church. Too many people are happy just being in church. Too many people are happy just coming and hitting all the check boxes and say, yeah, that's a good church service. We need folks to be committed to church and life after the victory. You have to stay committed. No one immediately quits living for God. Have you ever seen someone come from an altar weeping and having the best Holy Ghost time and then leaving their keys on the altar and say, I'm never coming back? It's a gradual process. That's that Casting Crown song, The Slow Fade. Mountains never crumble in a day. It's the casual erosion as the wind takes one rock away at a time. As the rain washes a little bit of dirt away at a time. And without nurturing it and refilling it soon, that mountain can be gone just simply by the act of erosion. All 30 used to be close to the king. And that's why they were among the 30. Because he trusted them to be among the closest. But only three were close enough to hear him when he needed something. Another story of life after the victory. I want to take you to Judges chapter 15, verse 14. We're going to talk about Samson for a minute. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loose from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. I would get tired of pulling the trigger on a gun a thousand times, much less swinging a jawbone hard enough to kill someone with it. A thousand times. And Samson said, With the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand, and called that place Ramathalia. And when he was sore of thirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Man, how do we do that? How often do we do the same thing? God has healed you so far, done so much for you, you get a new ailment, you think that's going to be the one that kills you. As if God has just wasted his time dragging you along this far. But God played and hollowed place that was in the jaw. And there came water thereout, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name thereof Enechor, which is in Lehi unto this day. 
the first thing he did after victory was he dropped the very tool that saved him. I remember, I told you before about the young boy in Hamburg with the cancer, with the brain tumor. You remember what I told you his mama said on why they quit coming to church after he got his healing? We got our healing. Why would he come to church no more? That's what she told him. She didn't understand the problem. We came. You got healed. Praise God. We're going home. We're done. And we look at that with snotty derision. How dare her. But we do the same thing. Oh, if God, if life is going great, church is almost an interference with your life. You don't want to come to church on Wednesday because it takes too much out of you. It's too hard to make that commitment. Even though church is the only thing saving you at the moment. It was church that brought your family back together. But now that you're having a good time with your family, you don't need the church no more. It, maybe it was the prayer life that really got you closer to God. And now that you're closer to God, it's time to quit pedaling the wheel and you just want to coast. We drop the very thing that saves us. Today, people are trying to change the church. My dad was complaining about someone responding to a preacher on the radio and said, you, you keep using all these Bible stories, but we have moved on from that. The, the Bible was written a long time ago. We have evolved. Realistically, there is a modern-day doctor of theology that was talking about the jawbone. And he used this as an illustration to let go of the old ways of the church. He felt that the church needed to drop the old paths and create new ones. And he used this story as his illustration. Sometimes you got to let go of it, is what he said. Sometimes you got to let go of the old ways. But what happened to Samson right after he let go of it? That's when he dried up. It, he didn't get thirsty until he let go of what God had given him to use. You don't get dried out at an altar. You get dried out when you think you don't need to come to an altar. You don't get tired out, dried out while worshiping. You get dried out when you're too busy to worship. When you drop the old ways is when you're going to dry out. You need to be careful what the world's telling you to let go of. If the world's telling you you don't have to live that way no more, it's all make-believe, it's all just superstition, go ahead and drop it and see what happens. But I'm going to hang to it, because guess what happened to Samson? He went back to it, and that's where the miracle had happened. Amen. It still works. This gospel still works. This truth still works. He still saves. It's still Jesus' name. It's still baptism. It's still holiness. It's still yes, Lord. The same thing that worked before, it works now. And that's part of life after the victory. We can't stop doing what works just because we don't see the battle no more. You have to keep your guard and stay in tune at all times. Yes, if you come get ready. Don't get too excited. I've got another note for her to start playing. So I just want you to get ready. We have lost, we as the United States have lost more soldiers to suicide than we have to all of the Iraq and Afghanistan war of this current season. All the bawling that you hear about, you know, caravans getting blown up. We've lost more of those soldiers here at home to suicide than we have to the enemy. Some lose their purpose. I told you earlier that they don't know how to live in peace. Some are haunted by the trauma. What is attacking you today? Maybe you prayed through or had a good moment a couple months ago, but now you're feeling kind of dry. What, what drives you up? What did you stop doing? What got in the way? What interfered? What's causing you to go that path? Sometimes, life after the victory, it can feel like rock bottom. I heard a preacher say, actually someone told me what he said, Matt Litton, I'll give him credit. Um, he's not a stranger to the sections that you may have heard. Anyway, he was recently at Star City, 
And he told them that it is impossible for you to hit, excuse me, rephrase that. It is impossible for a child of God to ever hit rock bottom. It's impossible. Because his hand always has you. His hand, God's hand, will hit rock bottom before you do. Let that sink in today. Life after the victory, you're still in his hands. And he will forever be that buffer between you and that rock bottom as long as you stay in his hands. There's an old adage, different ways of telling it, but if a person has $86,400 in their hands and some crook comes up and they steal $60 and they run away with it, do you think that person is going to throw away their 86 grand to go after that 60? They may file a police report, but they're going to guard their 86,000. You have 86,400 seconds in one day. Why are we wasting our 86,000 because of one bad minute of your, of your day? Why do we waste so many precious seconds in time because of one bad thought, one bad memory, one bad neighbor? It's not worth it. The balance doesn't weigh out. Let it go and protect what you still have. I want us to stand. I'm going to give you one last illustration. I'm going to ask Daniel if you'd come up here and assist me. He's getting, you don't got to sing, sir. I want to give you a, a, a shot. Go here. Sometimes life is rough. <laughs> now, what would you do if you were in this situation? Okay. Now, Kevin, what would you do if you're in this situation? Fight or flight, man. Daniel's playing back his toe. Shannon, what would you do if you're in this situation? I wouldn't try to get away. That is my point today. We always put ourselves in the victim mentality, but I never said that Daniel was the victim. Maybe I got a hold of my problem and I'm tired of him giving me grief. Maybe I'm gonna maybe I'm gonna take control of my life and I need to finish them. Go sit, go back. Stay standing. We always put ourselves in the victim mentality. We always assume we're the one being choked. Bless God, the gates of hell shall not prevail against our church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. You are not a victim. You are the victor. You are not a chump. You are not a loser. You are the one that God has chosen. It's time for us to be the aggressor, even after the victory. It's not time to let go. Life after victory is time to keep moving on to the next battle. Hallelujah. Keep marching. Keep believing. Keep fighting. I want to open you up to anybody that felt like they're getting tired. Anybody that felt like they're exhausted and struggling because they thought they're in, they're in between. This is your moment to renew your spirit. This is your moment to renew your purpose. This is your moment to renew your strength. Will you come and will you pray this morning?